You guys hear me? Man, I don't know what else to say about the band that hadn't already been said. Wow. Yeah. They, they definitely make it easier for me to get up here. So I wrote this down, this story, so that I wouldn't leave out any details that may or may not be a true story. Do you guys know our newest uh, lay pastor, Dan Kelly, right here? Raise your hand, Dan. Yeah. Now, I, I started not to do this because Dan had kind of a rough week, but I'm going to pick on him a little bit. And maybe it'll make him feel better because this is how we do each other. So I went to Dan's house the other day, and I knew he was home. His pickup truck was there. It's before it caught on fire. <laughs> and uh, I knocked on his door, and I could hear him shuffling around inside, but he never came to the door. And I thought, this sucker, I'm going to get him. So I left him a little note, and I quoted... Revelations 3.20, which says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. So I thought, here, eat that. Straight from the word of God. <laughs> so, a couple of days later, Dan leaves a note on my truck that is from Genesis 3.10. It says, it says uh, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. <laughs> Not a true story. <laughs> yeah, you could see that happening though, right? Let's, let's pray for the message. Father, I thank you for the day. I thank you for this unbelievable body of believers that you have surrounded me with. I thank you for the band that leads the praise and worship that just kind of kicks off the whole morning. I pray that this morning that you speak through me, that you help me to speak with boldness and authority, Father and that we just keep the momentum rolling, and it rolls right out these doors into our community, and that we make an impact for your kingdom to come. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, I'm going to do things a little bit different this morning. I'm going to start with a scripture. Uh, you see, this week, man, like the last couple of sermons I've done, I felt like God started talking to me like weeks in advance, and I was smart this time and started writing it down so that I didn't have to guess. And uh, this week, you know, like I struggled because I had my thoughts were all over the place. And like by Wednesday, I did not know what I was going to preach about. I was starting to panic and I was talking to Jeff about it. And I told him about it, a couple of conversations I had. And he said, you're a moron. <laughs> yeah, that's my disciple or my mentor said that. And he said, that's your message right there. God's been putting that on your plate all week. And I thought. Well, yeah, I guess he kind of has. But my message today is about peace. It's about having peace. I want to start in Philippians. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard our hearts and minds as we live in Christ Jesus. Peace. Now, I'm not talking so much about the cliche like world peace. I know most of you guys would like to maintain that through superior firepower, it being a cowboy church and all. But what I'm talking about is that peace that you have in here, that like no matter what happens, nothing can rattle you. You guys got a friend like that? Like I had some friends like that growing up. Nothing bothered them. I generally wanted to punch them in the throat so that something would bother them because that ain't in me, man. When things go wrong, I fly off the handle. Like, I want there to be a problem. I want an excuse for going crazy when things don't go my way. So I was always envious of those people that could tap into that peace that seemed like they always had it. See, it's easy to have peace when everything's going good. Man, I want rainbows without the rain. I want unicorns and cotton candy clouds. It's easy to be peaceful, to praise God in those moments. But what about when we're failing at something? Like when we are trying so hard, but we keep failing. How do we have that peace? Or what about when we're being tempted? When we're being tempted, we think we cannot resist it. How can we have a peace that supersedes everything we can understand? Or the big one, 
What about when we're in pain? Physical, emotional, spiritual, what about when we are suffering in pain? How can we have that peace? Can we experience that kind of peace that supersedes everything that we can understand? And I picked those three because those are the three that I deal with. So remember that anytime I'm up here, I am preaching to Jeremy Levi. These are the things I'm struggling with. So I started thinking about failure. And I, you know, I was trying to dig back because failure seems to stick out in our minds, you know, the things we didn't do very good at. And the earliest one I could remember was from sixth grade. That's how bad it sticks out. It's kind of a funny story. But uh, I used to love playing sports as a kid. Now, before sixth grade, you know, everything you play is recreation. You know, you pay money to be on the team. So the coaches are fairly nice. But in sixth grade, you got to try out for the team. So I was on the football team. I was pretty good at football, and the next sport was basketball. And I was like, man, I'm going to try it at basketball. Now, you might look at me now and say, I bet he can ball. I couldn't then. I was kind of a short, fat kid. But I practiced, man, I practiced real hard. And I remember the day of that tryout, I was going up for layups and, like, looking at the coach, like, See that? He's trying to hit those three-pointers like, let it rain. I'd look at the coach. I remember the end of that tryout, he had his clipboard, and he was walking, you know, going through the name saying, I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow. This is what he said, Levi, you still got too much baby fat. I'll see you next year. <laughs> you imagine if a coach said that to a kid today? <laughs> Man, it'd be all over the news. He was like, I'll see you at football practice tomorrow, though. Coach Cavett, God love him. But that was my first failure, my first failure that sticks out in my mind. But what I want to talk about today, what about the serious stuff in life that we're failing at? What about our careers, if we're failing at a career? What if it's a marriage? What if it's a close family member or your family life that you're failing at? See, the truth is, you'll never know the strength of your relationship with Jesus Christ until you experience some failure. And a lot of times the test of that faith will come through the failures. Man, I want to go to our second scripture for today. It comes from Luke. It's in Luke 9, starting in 3, but let me give you the backstory. Jesus is about to send out his disciples to preach. And I'm sure a lot of you guys have read this story before, but he gives them power. He gives them power to cast out demons, to proclaim the gospel, and then he gives them instructions. Starting in 9.3, he says, Take nothing for your journey. He instructed them, Don't take a walking stick, a traveler's bag, food, money, or even a change of clothes. Now, it kind of sounds like he's setting them up for failure. He says, Wherever you go, stay in the same house until you leave town. And if a town refuses to welcome you, Shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their fate. So they began their circuit of the villages, preaching the gospel, the good news, and healing the sick. So here's what I always took from that story for years. Is if somebody doesn't receive the gospel, it is okay to cut them off. You don't even want the dirt from them to remain on you. He does say that, but here's the greater meaning to that. Jesus gave them power to go preach. And he didn't say, when they don't receive it, you're our failure, come running back. I hate to quote Taylor Swift, but he said, shake it off. <laughs> shake it off and keep going. That's right. To fully trust God the way the disciples did, taking nothing, even in the failures, God has this. And I have great peace in that. I have great peace in that knowing in my failures, I'm going to draw nearer to him. See, fail, failure a lot of times pushes us to where God wants us to be. Failure pushes us to where God wants us to be. And here's the thing, it ain't always a location. Sometimes it's a heart posture when we're failing. God is pushing us to where he wants us to be. See, some of us, we, we know God. We know him. We say, hey, I grew up in the church. I got saved when I was nine. I've been baptized. But we still rely on ourselves to get stuff done. What am I talking about? We're praying for something. 
it's not happening, what do we do? We work harder, we push harder, we pray more, but how are we praying? How are we praying? Are we praying for His will to be done? Are we praying for our, our will? Now, something I always share with the teens that I'll share with you guys is, man, it's okay to pray for a desire that you have in your heart. But here's what you got to do. You got to say, if that's not your will for me, take that desire from my heart and replace it with something that is. And you know what will happen? He'll show up and answer that prayer every time. Every time. Yep. See, he wants us to the point where we are relying on him completely. Our heart posture has to be in the right spot when we're coming out of failure. Our relationship with Christ is strengthened through those failures. We're all going to fail. Man, we are born to fail. If you want to get that simplistic about it. We're born with sin in us. We are born to fail. That's why Christ had to die. Failure pushes you to where God wants you to do, wants you to be. So maybe you failed at some big things. Maybe you failed at a marriage. Maybe you failed at reaching a family member. Maybe you're failing at a career right now. Here's what God wants me to tell you this morning, and it's Paul's words from Philippians 3.13. Forget the past and focus what lies ahead. Focus on the future. Shake it off. And experience his peace. So failure. Now what about temptation? How many of you guys just love it when temptation shows up? They're like, oh yeah, man, I've been waiting to be tempted all day. Man, I, I, I can't stand it. I get angry sometimes. I'm like, man, I'm doing all these things and I'm still getting tempted. Why are we tempted? We're trying to do the work God wants us to do. We're trying to be in his will, but temptations keep coming. So in, in Luke uh, 7, 1 or 17, 1, Jesus says, there's always going to be temptations. Now, that, that does not give me peace. That makes me say, dang, what hope do I have if there's always going to be temptations? No matter how much I grow, no matter how, how close I get to you, I'm still going to be tempted. Let's look at what Paul says in Romans. One of my favorites, man. In Romans 8, starting in 18, this is Paul. He says, And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyways. But if I do what I don't want to do, am I not really the one doing wrong? Is it sin living in me that does it? And I have to read that several times to even make sense of it. But I wish I'd have known that verse when I was a little kid when I got in trouble. Because I'd been like, it wasn't me. It was the sin living in me, Ma. <laughs> so you know Yancey's going to be saying that. It wasn't me, Ma. So when I read that, man, that, I'm like, gosh, that's kind of disheartening. Like, you are Paul. Like, you saw Jesus. You know, you saw him after he died. He came back to pick you specifically, and you're struggling with this stuff? And then Jesus told me there's always going to be temptations? Man, am I fighting a losing battle? But this is what I love what Paul says. He carries on in verse 21. He says, I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power. There's another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. He's having a pity party. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. God, the answer is our Lord Jesus Christ. The answer to what hope do I have is Jesus Christ. He is our hope. Man, if you are being tempted 
or if you have a pet sin that you keep grabbing a hold of, that you don't want anybody out to know about, you got to pray your way through it. you got to rebuke your way through it. You do what you got to do to defeat that sin in your life. Look at it like a demon, and you're going to exercise it every time it shows its ugly head. All of our hope comes from Jesus. All of our peace comes from Jesus. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, He will show you a way out so that you can endure. He will show you a way out if you look for it. If you pick your head up and look for a way out, he will show you. But you know why I know that? Because he said so right there in his word. Yep. God is faithful. He'll show you a way out. I take great peace in knowing that. Temptations are not going anywhere. They're going to keep coming. My peace comes from knowing he's going to show me a way out if I look for it. Man, I want, I want to tell you something that uh, some of you probably know, but there might be some of you that don't know. Do you know when you are attacked the most by Satan? When you are tempted the most? It is right before you are about to do something really good for the kingdom of God. He is going to throw everything he can at you. He probably did it to some of you this morning coming to church. He probably gave you two or three reasons why you needed to be somewhere else this morning. If you don't believe that, volunteer to go to a conference or like take the kids to camp. It'll, it'll happen, right? Satan will attack you when you're about to have a huge impact for the kingdom. Most of us know that. Now, let, here's the part that you probably don't know. You know when you are the most vulnerable to temptation? It is right after you've made a big impact for the kingdom. Right after a high, you will be the most vulnerable. You know why? Because Satan wants to tear down everything you just did. If you don't believe that, try it. Try making a big impact for the kingdom. See, I'm probably a party pooper because when people get baptized, they're like, oh, we're so proud of you. You are going to be attacked this week. <laughs> so I want them to know, man. I don't want to lie to them. I want them to be ready for it. You know, where's the peace in that? Do you think, man, I'm going out on a limb. I'm doing all these things. I'm trying to impact the kingdom, and I'm being attacked. I'm vulnerable to temptation afterwards. Where is the peace in that? And sometimes I have my own pity party like Paul did. And like I just picture Jesus with a crown of thorns, bloody, tore up. And he's like, yeah, I get it, man. I had to die for him. And I'm like, okay, you win. I'm just tired. My peace is in knowing that Christ experienced the same thing. Now I'm going to be real and I'm going to be vulnerable for a minute. Because there are some days that I sit right there in that chair right before I come up here and I pray. I say, God... Get me through this sermon, but I am calling Jeff tomorrow and quitting. No, I'm being, I'm serious. Like, I'm going to call him and quit because I hear the lies. Man, I hear the lies that I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy to get up there and tell anybody anything of how they should be living. I hear the lies telling me I'm not educated enough. I hear the lies telling me I'm too young to have an impact for the kingdom. Jeff is so old. <laughs> Not you, Kim. You're beautiful. <laughs> but I am tempted to run. I'm tempted to quit and run. But here's, here's what happens every time that I start buying into that stuff. One of you will come and pray over me. One of you will say something to me that I needed to hear. And you know what? Like... God spoke to me through you, and you never even knew it. That's what happens every time. Amen. Thank you, guys. You know, Hebrews 4.15 says that Christ was tempted 
the same way we are. We can have peace when those temptations come if we know Jesus Christ, if we're putting all of our hope in him. See, all my hope is in him and all the peace that I have in my life comes from him, from knowing him. Peace and temptation. So what about pain? What about when we're experiencing pain? Now, you know, three tours in Iraq and one to Afghanistan, I saw some pretty wild and horrific things, but what was always hilarious to me is like somebody's leg would be dislocated and twisted around and we'd say, oh man, this might hurt for a minute. I'm pretty sure it's going to hurt. You know, maybe not just for a minute, it might hurt for a while. My favorite one is going to the dentist. When they pull out that big needle to numb you up and you're pretty sure it's going to press straight into your brain and they're like, you might feel some pressure or a slight stinging. And then they give you that shot and they disappear while it takes effect. I look around for an oxygen and a settling bottle because it feels like they used a cutting torch in my mouth. But they say it'll only hurt for a minute. You know, spiritual pain, emotional pain, can be just as serious, man. It can wreck us out. And it hurts. It's hard to be at peace when you've lost a child. Now, I've never had that happen, and I pray to God that I never have to do that, but I've been around some of you that have, and that is horrible. It is hard for me to tell you that God's got peace for you when you're going through something like that. It is hard to have peace when you've got a family member, a, a child that is living 180 degrees from God. It is hard to tap into that peace when it feels like God isn't answering your prayers. Here's what I want to tell you. Pain can be a pathway to a deeper relationship with Christ. See, it's usually at those, to at those times that we draw the nearest to him. It's usually at those times when we are on our knees earnestly seeking him. Pain motivates us to change. Pain motivates us to change the way we're living, to get rid of those things, if we can, that are causing us pain. Isaiah 48.10 says, I have refined you, but not as silver is refined. Rather, I have refined you in the furnace of suffering. When we refine metal, man, we heat it up to get all the impurities out of it heat it up to get all the impurities out so that it comes out better than it went in. See, the pains of this world are our furnace, man. They are the things that are going to get the impurities out of us. My peace is in knowing how I will come out of that furnace, how I'll come out of that fire. That's how I get peace and pain. Now, a lot of us, we, as we associate doing really good with being on top of the world. You ever heard that? Like, man, he is on top of the world. He is on the mountain looking down. He's doing good. And now what are the low points in our life? We say, oh, man, he, he's walking through the valley. There's a Bible scripture about that. Oh, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. All the bad things are in the valley, right? Who's from the valley? <laughs> Have you ever been on a mountaintop, like a, like a big mountain, like above the timber line? Is there any growth up there? Is there anything living up there? Where's all the growth at? Down in the valleys. What's the land that the farmers want? Do they want the top of the mountain? No, they want the rich, luscious, fertile valleys. Where I'm going with, where I'm going with this is, is that pain grows us. Pain grows our spiritual lives. James 1, uh, 1, 2 through 3 says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Now, I'm not going to lie and tell you that's going to be easy. I am not going to tell you you are always going to be joyful when you see that pain coming. But here's some truth. It does get easier. Those, it'll look like a, 
we call them charts, like the highs and the lows get closer together, like a heartbeat. You don't have to love your story right now if you're experiencing pain. You don't have to love your kid's story right now. But the thing you need to focus on and find peace with is that when you come through this pain, when your children, your family members come through this pain, what a testimony they will have to share the love and grace of Jesus Christ with others. What God wants you to know today is he will not waste your pain that you're experiencing right now. He will not waste your pain if you rely on him. You know, I started with Philippians 4, where I talked about God's peace exceeds anything we can understand. It says his peace will guard our hearts and minds as we live for him. And I hope you're hearing that today. I hope you're hearing that God cares. God cares through the failures. God cares about you through the temptations. God cares about you through the pain. Maybe you're thinking, man, I hear you. I know that scripture. And I feel it. I feel the Holy Spirit's presence today. But how? How do I do that? How do I tap into that peace? Isaiah 26, 3 through 4, it says, You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is the eternal rock. Now, I don't know what you're struggling with today. You know, I don't know if you've known him your whole life or if you're hearing about him for the first time today. What I'm asking you, will you start to trust him today? Will you start to fix your thoughts on him today? All those things you're carrying around, all your failures, all your pain, all your temptations... Will you leave those things at the foot of the cross today and let him clean it up? Will you start to let him, let him work in your life today? Will you trust him? Will you fix your thoughts on him today? All of my hope, all of my peace comes from knowing my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you I thank you for a day to come together and worship you and to dive into your word. I thank you, Father, for the failures that you give us in life because I know those failures draw me one step closer to you. I thank you for the temptations. Even though I hate to see them coming, Father, I thank you for them because they give me a chance to increase my endurance to live for you. Lord, I thank you for the pain because though... It hurts. It motivates me to look up when I want to keep relying on myself, Father. It motivates me to trust you. I don't know specifically what people are dealing with today, but I know there's some failures going on. I know there's some temptations, and I know there's some pain. I pray that this morning, Father, you will send the Holy Spirit on those people and that you'll talk to them and that they will hear you, Father, and that they will do what you want them to do, and that they will take all that baggage, all those things that they're struggling with, and they'll leave them at the foot of the cross, and they'll start to fix their thoughts on you today, Father God. I know you can do it. You've told us time and time again that you can and that you will if we ask. I'm asking, Lord, motivate them. Motivate them today. Lord, I pray that if there's somebody in here that doesn't know you, that doesn't know your son, Jesus Christ, but they feel him today, Father. They feel the call to come to know him today, Father. That they would pray a simple prayer right where they're sitting, just like this. Lord, I am a sinner saved by grace. I believe that your son, Jesus Christ, he came to this earth and he was perfect. He was the perfect sacrifice. I believe that he died on a cross and that his blood paid for my sins. And then I believe he defeated death and he is at your right hand, Father, and he is coming back again. He is coming back again. 
Father, I pray that you be with this body of believers throughout the week, that you just lead us, guide us, and direct us, that you keep us motivated as we enter a new season of building a, a new building, Father, so that we can have a greater impact for your kingdom. And I know with that we're going to be attacked, but I pray that you give us all the fortitude to endure it, to rebuke it, and to pray our way through it. We love you, Father God, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.